Good evening, everyone. My name is Louis Pulido with the Belmar Public Library. Thank you for coming tonight to this joint presentation between us, well, along with us, in partnership with the Belmar Shade Tree Commission for this home landscaping presentation. Uh, the Belmar Shade Tree Commission wants to, everyone to know that they now have a page on the Belmar Borough website. So you can always go on to the Belmar Borough website, search for the Sh Belmar Shade Tree Commission to find out all their latest information that they, that they have posted up there also. So, and also, when you get a chance, go on your Facebook page and follow and like and subscribe to their Facebook page as they, so you get the, all their latest announcements that they put up on there, too. So today, we are proud to have Bill Brash over here on his uh, present home landscaping presentation. Bill is a, a New Jersey-approved consulting forester and a licensed tree expert, and he's going to talk to us today about how to select trees, shrubs, and flowers to create our own home ecosystem. Bill, welcome. Thank you for coming and take it away. Thank you. Okay. This guy is quite a resource. <laughs> Lewis is quite the resource, let me tell you. Um, listen, I, I want to thank Diane and Lynn from the Belmar Shade Tree Commission. This all started down at the Shade Tree Federation meeting last October. We sat for lunch and they were talking about getting CUs and I said, I give presentations and you know, you can, you can get them that way. To, to gain the accreditation for Belmar. And they said, okay, and Diane gave me a call, so here we are. And let's get started, okay? Um, this is what she asked for. Diane wanted to know how residents in Belmar could enhance their property for wildlife and Point Pleasant. Hi, Ann. Point Pleasant's here. We can sign this. You can sign it on the way out. Yeah. Okay. How are you? This is for you. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. You're doing anything. Terrific. So these are some of the things that we're going to go over tonight. All right. Tree shrub and herbaceous selection for your garden to make it a home ecosystem, to add and enhance the habitat for a variety of critters, pollinators, birds, whatever you want. There's also something on energy conservation. I mean, it's not just what you're doing for the wildlife in Belmar, but how you can help save money on your energy bill as well, just by doing all this. Okay, aha. Planting do's and don'ts. If you're going to plant, you should know how to do it properly. Um, you would think that anybody knows how to plant either a tree or a shrub, but you'd be surprised. There's a lot of bad planting out there, and I, I get to see it. There's even worse pruning out there, so we can go over that as well. Um, because you have to maintain these landscapes that you're going to be planting to enhance for wildlife as well. Uh, and then there's pollinator enhancement tips. There's, uh, I'll even tell you how to tell the difference between male and female butterflies. Does anybody know how to do that? Oh, it's pretty cool. Oh, okay, good. And I'm going to have a series of questions, okay? Uh, and we're going to all get tested on this, all right? So uh, you don't have to get the questions right, okay? But if you're an offer, all right, you get a smoky bookmark. Perfect for the library, okay? People actually still read books instead of using Kindle, all right? And I have a ton of leftover smoky bookmarks. I do a lot of work for the Forest Fire Service, so I get a lot of their, their swag. So <clears throat> here we go. This might be easier. Cool birds in your yard. I'll even show you how I ID some birds even without seeing them just by, by some of the things that they've done in your yard. What do we got here? All right. And then tree diagnostic tips, okay? You can, might be able, some things that you may think are really detrimental to your tree and you're concerned about it, there may be no reason to. And I'll give you some of those uh, ideas as well as to, as to what's bad and, and what's not so bad and you don't need to worry about, okay? So what does your home ecosystem need to contain to be enhanced or to provide habitat for wildlife. And it's the same thing 
as a healthy forest in the woods. And that's what they call um, <clears throat> vertical layering or stratification. A healthy forest has a canopy. It has an understory of smaller trees that can grow in a shade. And then it has a shrub layer. All right. And there's birds and critters that occupy each one of those layers. And then there's a forb layer in the bottom as well that hides insects and hides mice and, and prey um, <clears throat> species for all the birds that occupy those upper areas. So you'll learn about how that contributes to a healthy and enhanced wildlife habitat. Also, there's edge. There's the difference between where your grass is and where trees are, OK? And there's, there's animals, insects, and uh, <clears throat> critters that, that occupy those areas of edge. And then certainly water. Water is a big attractant to wildlife. They can't survive without it, same as us. So even a very small water feature uh, can be very beneficial and, and add. Butterflies all the time use shallow areas of water. Um, it's amazing you, how you can see them doing that. OK, so let's go back one. It's small, OK? You, in Belmar, I'm sure the yards are not that big, all right? So you're kind of limited in what you can do. But you'd be surprised in small spaces what you can create and how you can attract birds to those areas. Um, <clears throat> especially diversity is a key. So what do we need for diversity? You need evergreens, OK? Evergreens are great, and uh, they don't go dormant. They don't lose their, their needles. They provide habitat and cover for birds year round. So that <clears throat> from prey, there's a lot of birds that only occupy evergreens, all right? Um, and we'll talk about some of those specific examples of species of evergreens that you can plant and what kind of uh, critters they attract. Did anybody get to see Doug Tammany up there at Monmouth College in his talk? Yeah. All right. He's fantastic in, uh, in how he gets down. When he, you would think he's a forester by reading his books. He's not. He's an entomologist. And he makes the connection between trees and the, the insects that they provide habitat for and how that's the building blocks of the food web. And it's, it's fascinating uh, if you get a chance to read his books how, um, how meaningful they are and, and how it creates an understanding of how, how you can make it a lot better for them. Grasses and meadows. There are some birds uh, that only inhabit meadows and grasses. Uh, bluebirds are one that don't like trees and don't like a lot of uh, woody material. All right, They like to be out in the open because they feed on insects. You can't attract them to a bird feeder because they don't really eat seed. So you have to have some meadows and grasses or you won't have bluebirds and you won't have purple martins, okay? which are another insect eating bird. So you, you need a combination of all these things to be able to attract as much different uh, birds and wildlife that you can. Trees and shrubs. We talked about that as well. They provide cover. They provide food. And people don't realize the connection that butterflies have to trees. All right? It's not just plants and flowers for nectar for the adults. They need a larval host plant because they go through that complete metamorphosis. And, it, and the caterpillars are totally different than the adults that are very fragile and beautiful and flail. They are just carnivorous or herbaceous eating machines. All they do is eat a lot of leaves and plants to get ready to make that conversion to the adult. So if you have those larval host plants in your yard, you'll get the caterpillars. If you have the caterpillars, you'll have the adult butterflies that you're really seeking. <clears throat> and then there's vines and flowers and everything. The more stuff that you have there, proper stuff, the better it is for your, your home landscape for uh, a wildlife perspective. OK, so how can you plant stuff to help with your energy conservation? I live in Freehold, and when I built my house in, back in 1993, it was an old soybean field. And we used to call it Windy Knoll. And when the wind came out of the west, which is the prevailing winds in New Jersey, it was 
brutal in the wintertime. It was like there was nothing between my house and the North Pole um, <clears throat> at all. And you could feel it coming through the windows. But if you plant evergreens on the west side or the north end, all right, it can block that wind. And the one thing that's important is if that tree's 10 feet high, okay, it'll uh, diffuse that wind eight times the height of the tree, all right? So it has to go up and over it'll go eight times before it comes back down again. So the taller your tree gets, the more protection you get from the wind, all right? <clears throat> Would the west sides be true also for coastal towns? Uh, in the afternoon, there's an eastern wind, okay? The wind kind of turns around, comes out of the east and, and off the ocean uh, in the afternoon. Uh, so you may have to put them on both sides. <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's a really good point. <clears throat> you know, that's a great question. As a matter of fact, you get a smoking pool. I have a grandson who's three who loves this, thinks it's real, and then one time he turned it around, he goes, what happened to Smokey? <laughs> he had no idea what, oh, oh, and then he was surprised. It was, it's wonderful. <clears throat> okay, so the most effective windbreaks are ones that are also evergreens and deciduous trees as well. You don't get a whole lot of winter protection from uh, deciduous trees when they lose their leaves, but evergreens are perfect year round. Put them in the right location, and you can not only protect from wind, but you can also protect uh, from the hot sun, all right? If you put them on the southwest side of your property, deciduous tree, you'll get the shade in the summertime. Leaves fall off in the fall, you'll get the sun coming in there in, in the wintertime. You just have to pick that. And let's see, I think I have a, a graphic here that'll show where you should plant them. There you go. Should we, do we need to turn the lights down a little bit here? Can you guys all see that? Would it help if you put the lights down a little bit? Yeah. Oh, good. Better? All right. I was trying to put my glasses on, but even that, there, much better. So you can see the house in the center, and you can see uh, where you would plant the deciduous trees, and certainly on the west and the north side, you have the, the uh, evergreens. All right, to, to help block the wind as well. And then also, because the angle of the sun changes throughout the seasons where it's a little lower in the wintertime and then higher in the summertime, as your trees grow, uh, you'll get a little more effectiveness. And you should not have a, an air conditioning unit exposed to the sun. You should find a way to shade that. It'll make it a, a, at least 10% more efficient. All right, 10% more efficient means your electric bill goes down, and who doesn't want that? At the same time, you're providing habitat for, for some bird that you're interested in, in bringing. So how to plant trees and shrubs. Um, how many people plant trees and shrubs in their yard or, or plant flowers, all right? Terrific. I see more things planted poorly and even more things pruned poorly. But there's a couple of tips that you should know, okay? And, and that is, Plant the tree, tree at the same depth that it was in the nursery, all right? And this is the important part. You see where that root collar is right there, that flare that comes out? That should be exposed, all right? Because that was the depth that the tree was grown in the nursery. And the problem is, is if you buy a tree that's bald and burlapped like that, or even if it's a container plant, all right? When it's dug in the nursery, they're taking this dirt and they're putting it on top, here and here. So when it's delivered to your house, the grade might be up here somewhere. So sometimes it's as much as six inches of the trunk that's exposed, that was exposed in a nursery that's now covered with earth and, and soil and mulch, all right? So there isn't a tree that comes out of the nursery that I have to do inspections that get planted in municipalities that we're not digging this area out just to expose that root flare. The number one killer of trees that are newly planted is the fact that they were planted too deep, all right? So make sure that that root flare is there. If it looks like a telephone pole coming out of the soil, it's too deep. You gotta have that root flare. Single most important part of uh, planting a tree, all right? When you go to plant it, you gotta get it plumb. How many people see a, pl a tree plant and it's kinda, it's off plumb, all right? Or it looks plumb and then they water it and then it's off plumb, right? 
That happens all the time because the soil gets loosened up, all right? You got to keep it pl plumb. When you do it, don't move the trunk to plumb the tree. Get a shovel or a spade and move the root ball, all right, to plumb the tree. And keep an eye on it. You should stake it. If it goes off plumb one time, stake it. I don't like to see stakes initially unless it's in a really windy environment or um, if it was watered and then it goes off plumb. If you have to replumb it, stake it at that point. All right. The other thing is when you stake a tree, don't lock it in so that it can't move. All right. One of the things about that is a tree needs to move s slightly in the breeze for it tells it that it needs to send growth all right, to the trunk to maintain the crown and the weight of the crown. If you lock it in there, it figures it's good. It'll send a lot of that energy to the crown, which will grow faster than the trunk, and then you have a problem. So you have to let it move a little bit. Stake it, all right, so that there's a little movement in the trunk, so that it knows exactly how much growth it has to send to the trunk to secure the, the weight of the crown. If you, if you get, uh, the tree from the nursery gets handled. Some trees are very brittle, they're twigs and branches, and they snap, prune them off. Or there's crossed or rubbing branches, all right? If you have that, prune them off so they're not rubbing against each other, that's gonna open up the bark and, and uh, produce an area that's uh, subject to disease or insects, all right? And that's really all you need to do other than water. And then when you water it, five gallons per inch of caliper every week, all right? So if it's a two inch gal caliper tree, all right, which you measure six inches above the, the ground, if that's two inch tree, which is standard nursery stock, all right, should get 10 gallons of water every week, all right? Good soaking. Good. Yes? Cutting the roots. Yes. So cut the root ball, is that what you're saying? Yeah, when you score the roots, if you get a container, yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks for that. You know, you, you get Smoky Bear. There you go. Yeah, it's a really good point. When you get containers, a lot of times they've been left in a container for a longer time, and the roots will get to the outside, of the, uh, inside the container, and they'll just start circling it. And uh, if, you, if you don't score the roots, which means you just put a cross down four sides, you just cut them, all right? Yeah, you just cut them from top to bottom on four, the cardinal directions, say, all right? And that, what that does is it prevents the circling because if, if you don't do that, you'll get what's known as a girdling root, and that root will continue to circle, and as they grow in diameter, they'll put pressure against the trunk and start to cut off the water and nutrient transport. Well, it only happens in nursery trees. It doesn't happen um, with seedlings that are grown naturally, but it's something that's it's real. And you could probably, we could walk around out here and we could probably point out, you know, Three or four out of every 10 trees probably have a girdling root. So make sure you cut those before you put them in, okay? Especially in containers. <clears throat> All right, let's see. What do you do with the burlap bags? The burlap bags yeah, with, with burlap, that's the other thing. Um, <clears throat> when you get a bald and burlap tree, it'll show up with a cage, usually because it's dug by a machine, and it'll get wrapped in burlap and then tied to lock it in place. You have to cut all that twine and pull the burlap back so you can see that root flare, all right? Some people say you have to remove the basket. Others say you should just make sure that a third of the basket is turned down. Um, <clears throat> we require on a lot of our contracts that they remove the basket, all right? But it's a pain in the neck if you're doing it yourself. If you have a landscaper doing it, make sure you tell him he's got to remove it. All right. And at the very least, he or she has to remove that burlap and cut all the twine around the trunk of the tree. Question? Yes. How do you feel about soil amendments? Um, in some instances, they work very well. Um, we have such sandy soil here. Yes. You know, soil amendments are, are good in the fact that they provide um, sandy soils with a lot more water holding capacity. 
Uh, so that's a good thing. Uh, it's always good, too, if you have the ability to dig a hole bigger than the tree itself. So you loosen that up and allow the roots additional room to get out. Soil amendments are good in those sandy situations. Also, species selection that do well in sandy soils w would be a good idea. Um, you know, some, some contracts require that, so that mycorrhizae uh, that's supposed to be beneficial to the roots. It's, all that's very species selective. And it's just kind of like a generic mycorrhizae. So I don't really know uh, how effective that is. And I think the research is kind of open on that. There's no, there's no real tie to the commercial mycorrhizae that you might add uh, to it. So, but, but yes, topsoil and, uh, and something that improves the soil quality for water holding is, is, would be good, especially in Belmar where it's, it's sandy. Okay, so here's some trees that are some of my favorites uh, for attracting wildlife and why. And they're all natives, okay? One of the things Doug Tammany talks about is the fact that our birds have evolved with the trees that are native. So th that they have a food source and, and they will be attracted to areas that have this source of food that they evolved with, all right? So the first one, and, and this, Parts of this presentation date back 15 years. And as I was going through this in preparation, Diane, I had to look at this, and there's a ton of stuff that's changed since then. And always the first tree that I used to recommend, it's a beautiful tree, is American Beach. And that's the one with the, the really uh, smooth gray bark that everybody carves their initials on. Okay, it's a native tree. The beech nut that is the fruit that it produces is the most nutritious of any of our native mass trees. All right. It was a great tree when I was in forestry school because we could always tell which one it was. If there were somebody's initials in it, it was a beech. All right. So, <clears throat> but I have an asterisk there now because there's a disease that showed up three years ago in Monmouth County called beech leaf disease. And right now, they're doing the research to try to find out a cure for it, but it appears to be 100% fatal. And it's, very, it's spread by a nematode, which is like a microscopic worm, all right? And they think that the, the nematodes are in bird droppings, and they're spreading it as far as they can fly, especially as they're in these migrations. So three years ago, we didn't hear of it. Now, if you walk, in Turkey Swamp Park in Freehold, there's several beach uh, stands in there, and they all have it. So the asterisk is there because beach is a tree that can be found in the nurseries. It's not common because it, it doesn't look good until it's much older than when you buy it in the nursery. But I would hesitate to plant beach now for uh, a few years until they figure out how to protect it from the beech leaf disease. Uh, <clears throat> But it's a wonderful tree uh, for wildlife. It grows in the shade. It's, uh, it's you know, part of the forest that's, um, you know, the end of it. It can perpetuate itself forever because it can grow up in the shade. Uh, another one is black gum. And uh, that's becoming more popular as well. And this is Savatica. It's a great tree. Produces a small little fruit that the birds love. Um, it, it also, as it gets older, it, it becomes uh, a cavity nesting tree for birds as well. They seem to uh, be able to, uh, you know, make a, make a hole in it and use it. I mean, it's not great in terms of uh, a street tree because of, uh, of that, but it's a great tree. It attracts a lot of birds as well. Has wonderful, wonderful fall color. It, it starts to turn in, in August and then it's a bright, bright red. Yes? No, that's a sweet gum, okay, which is another native tree that's, that's also a pretty good, uh, you know, it's a pretty good wildlife tree, except for the fact that it drops those fruits that, that everybody hates. Um, <clears throat> the ones that if you hit with the lawnmower, it hits you in a shin, it's sticking to the side of your leg because it's spiky. Um, <clears throat> but that's sweet gum as opposed to this one, which is black gum. You could always tell this tree, too, because the, the branches are kind of feathery, and they come out exactly perpendicular to the trunk. If you see that tree where the branches are coming out perpendicular to the tree, it's probably a black gum. And we're starting to see that uh, being planted a lot more. 
Sweet gum is the next one on that list. And in there, you can see uh, what birds are attracted to the seeds and fruit of, of each of these trees. Um, I think this is going to get posted certainly to the website if you can't see that now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but the first three are all natives. Next is Quercus alba and Quercus ruba, which is red oak and white oak. All right. Our native oaks are, um, are by far <clears throat> provide the most habitat to, to the entire food web logarithmically higher than any other species, all right? It's an old genus. It's been around for hundreds of millions of years, and there's a lot of stuff that evolved with it. Spiders, insects, everything that creeps and crawls has found a home in oak. And as a result of that, there's entire species of birds that evolved with them feeding on them. And, uh, and so if you wanted to plant one tree that would provide the most habitat for the most critters, it would be an oak, all right, bar none. And there's two, two families to the oak genus. It's the white oaks and the red oaks. And as a bonus, we're going to talk about how you tell the difference between them. And it's very simple. There's the two leaves. The red oak side of the family has got pointy lobes, OK? You can see that here. This is a red oak leaf, but every tree in the red oak family has got a point at the tip. Every tree in the white oak family is rounded, all right? So this is red oak, black oak, pin oak, uh, willow oak that has a leaf like a willow, but it's got a point at the end, and then the white oaks, which is include swamp white oak, chestnut oak, post oak, all those oaks with rounded lobes, they're in the white oak family. Why is that important? Who knows why that's important? What's the difference between the right, white and the red oaks? Other than one's red and the other one's white. They produce acorns at different times. Red oaks produce acorns that mature in two seasons. All right. White oaks produce an acorn that, that is mature in one season. Why do they do that? They, you know, I think evolutionary uh, scientists believe that the reason is if it's produced every other year, kind of confuses the squirrels and the blue jays that eat them, and they're not sure, all right? Uh, and so a, may, a few of them might be left over to actually germinate into oak trees, red oak trees. And the white oaks, they just overwhelm the squirrels. Every year there's acorns, and their memory is not as good as, as maybe it should be, and they forget a lot. So those are the two reasons. Uh, you'll get white, white oaks are, um, Produce acorns every year, red oaks every other year. Uh, because of that, white oaks, you, as soon as the acorns drop, you can plant them that fall, all right? Red oaks, 18 months to mature, they drop the second year, they have to go through a cold stratification period before you can germinate them, all right? So <clears throat> that's important. Why else is it important? Red oaks have a disease right now called bacterial leaf scorch, all right? It's 100% fatal to oaks. And it's here in Spring Lake, I know that. And it's probably in Belmar as well. Uh, the white oaks are more resistant to it. So I, I, I recommend, if you want to plant an oak, that you probably select a, one in a white oak family. And now you know how to tell the difference. Bill? Yes? The, the swamp oaks, those are in the white oak family? Yes, yeah, swamp white oak is... Uh, Wonderful tree. Some of the white oaks are very difficult to transplant in a nursery. Um, swamp white oak is one of those that is not that difficult. And it's a little bit smaller. It doesn't get as big as a white oak. It's a little bit smaller. Cool looking egg corn. Uh, and it has, uh, it, it has a corky bark to it as well. So it has winter interest. It's, great. it's actually my favorite tree, uh, nursery tree. And you can find it in just about any catalog. And there's a few more hickories, Cario ovata, shag bark, bark hickory. If anybody sees that tree, it kind of the bark peels on it. Drew, yes? You mentioned winter stratification. What is that actually? Okay, uh, some seed for it to become viable has to go through a cold period. Okay, in other words, a tree would drop it in the fall, but it wouldn't germinate until the next spring, and it has to go through a cold period to be able to be viable. Okay, so uh, in nurseries, that, that, like this state tree nursery in Jackson, it takes 
seed and then transfer this out to seedlings and grows them, they would they have a cold room where they stratify the seed right there. Okay, and there's a there's a whole book on on how how to do that that the U.S. Forest Service puts it out by species exactly how you have to treat the seed if you want it to germinate, and that's that's the number one. Yeah, I just I just can I ask you a follow up question. So I had gotten a few chestnuts. Okay. Uh-huh. And I read on it and they told me to put the chestnuts in peat moss and put them in a refrigerator over the winter before <laughs> I germinated them in the spring and that's what I did. Yeah. Is that what you're referring to? That's it. Yes, that's exactly it. That's stratification. That's the process. How did they do? I got one, it's about ten foot tall. Good. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a research book uh, U.S. Forest Service puts out for every species how how to how to treat the seed if you want it to germinate. Also, they've done all the studies so they know a lot of trees uh, their seed is not viable as soon as it's, you know when it's produced. Like tulips, I think uh, or yellow poplar, it's only mm -hmm. seven or eight percent viable. Where some other trees are viable for eighty or ninety percent of the seeds that that's produced. So um, it's very useful. If you plant a couple of them and you think you're going to get a tree out of that, like you, you know, you got a couple, you got one, right? I have four at one, once a Yeah, row. yeah. It was a European, it wasn't American. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's, it's not always, you know, that we're not doing the right thing. It's the fact that the seed is not viable, a low percentage of it's viable. Shagbark hickory is great. We're going to be talking about bats a little bit later, and that's a great tree for bats because as the bark peels in the summertime, the bats will go in the evening after they finished feeding and they'll, they'll roost up under that bark for the night. And so uh, hickory's kind of protected in that way. You can't really harvest it while the bats are around because bats are protected now more probably than just about any other species we have. The other one is river birch, which is a great tree too. That's the one that kind of has a reddish tinge to it. It's multi-stemmed multi and has that peely bark as well. Uh, there's a lot of critters that feed on uh, male catkins or the uh, flowers in the, in the spring. So there's trees that you might consider for your yard. We would also want to put them in our parks, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. So if we had large park areas that we need to focus on, pretty much any of these? Those yeah, those are canopy trees. trees, yep, without a doubt. Um, the next one is shrubs. Okay, these are all native shrubs as well. And uh, the first one on the list, and you may not know all of these or even uh, only a couple of them because they're natives and they're not always the showiest uh, that you would want to see in a nursery. All right, Lindera benzoin is spice bush. Does anybody know this shrub? It's a great shrub. It really is. It flowers in the spring, early, early spring. Like it's about ready to flower now. Um, before the leaves come out, it's got a pale yellow flower. And uh, you notice it because nothing else really is flowering at the time. And uh, it produces a berry that the birds love. Um, the deer love it too, they'll browse on it. Okay, so you, you gotta protect it from deer if you have a, a lot of deer. Uh, I went to forestry school in West Virginia and the, the folks in West Virginia will take these leaves and they'll steep them and make a tea out of it. If you crush them, they smell very lemony. So if you ever get an opportunity to have spice bush tea, it's not bad. Some things are not good, but that one's not bad. Okay, the other one is maple leaf viburnum. That's actually a native viburnum, and it's called that because the leaf looks just like a maple. All right, produces a cluster of beautiful, showy white flowers in the spring, um, <clears throat> and it produces a lot of berries in the fall and the birds love them. I have two of these in my yard and I, they're almost the first to lose their berries once they mature because the birds love them so much. And the deer will browse this more than they will anything else. <clears throat> if there isn't any of this around, they'll browse your arborvitaes. The next one is service, what was that? What kind of viburnum? Maple leaf? A maple leaf viburnum. Thank you. Yeah. It's a great native shrub. Next one is amelanchy or service berry. Um, <clears throat> this one is the oak of shrubs. This one produces and, and enhances and provides habitat for more critters and, and, and probably any of the other shrubs as well. Beautiful white flowers in the spring. 
produces a berry that the, this is the first one that the birds hit when the berries uh, become ripe. Yes, Lynn. About how old before they start producing berries? So like, uh, like a service berry. Okay, service berry is probably five years. Okay, good. You know, depending on how big it is in the nursery when you buy it. If it's three to four feet, it, it might produce it the first year a little bit, and as it grows older, it'll, it'll be more pro, prolific. Okay. okay. Thank you. Um, I was once hiking with buddies in the, in the Shenandoah National Park, and we were in a grove of these. And that night, one of the bears got in a bunch of fermented ones of these and got drunk <laughs> and just spent the whole night crashing through the woods, and I thought he was going to end up in our lap. I didn't get a lot of sleep that night, so. Um, the next one is elderberry, which is another native shrub. And if anybody ever offers you elderberry wine, politely decline, okay? Because that is not good like spice bush tea. That is really bad. But it produces another cluster of, of, uh, of berries after a beautiful white flower as well. And uh, very profuse, grows in wet areas. Um, and it's got a hollow stem. It's more of a primitive type thing, but it gets fairly large in these wetland areas. But it's, it's got a nice flower in the spring and a beautiful berry for the birds. The next one is flowering dogwood, which people know. The, the bracts are the part that looks like a flower. The flower is a little less conspicuous, but it produces a berry that a lot of birds like as well. Washington hawthorn. The hawthorns, there's like 150 species of them that are native. That one is one that's produced in the nurseries, produces a nice white flower as well, and, um, and, and berries, and produces a thorn. It's a nasty thorn, as a matter of fact. So it produces a, a habitat for the birds because they'll hide in it. You know, it's, a, it's protective. There's uh, no raptors like hawks or anything that are going to go in there to get torn up trying to get them. So they find uh, a, a lot of safe uh, havens there. Blueberry. Blueberry is delicious. Birds like it, pheasants like it, squirrels like it, just about anything eats a blueberry too. And it produces a nice, but not as showy white flower in the, in the early spring. There's a shrub dogwood called red osier dogwood, and you've seen it probably. It's got a bright red twig to it, okay? It has great winter interest because of that, and it, it produces um, uh, berries as well that the birds love. So there's a lot of so now, now you're starting to get a, an idea of, of what a canopy tree can provide in terms of nuts, okay, and fruit in, in it, okay, with the black gums. And now you're, you're down into the shrub layer and all the berries and the habitat that that shrub layer can produce. If you have both of them working in conjunction, you've doubled the amount of habitat and critters that, that would be attracted to your yard. Plants, butterflies, and we'll get into the butterflies too. Um, how many, is there anybody in here Master Gardeners? Went through the Master Gardeners program? Okay. Um, <clears throat> does anybody know butterfly weed? Yes. You know a lot. She does. You do. <laughs> you get two. Oh You've raised your hand more than any other person so far. Okay, so butterfly weed is in the milkweed family, um, but it doesn't produce that milky sap that, that gives it its name, but it's in the same family, and monarchs will, will nectar on that plant. Uh, they won't necessarily feed on it like they do as caterpillars on the traditional milkweeds, but it's, it's unusual in it, it clusters of orange flowers. That's it on the top. Another great one is uh, Monarda. Is anybody familiar with this one as well? That's a great flower, it's very unusual. And they have a lot of different colors to it. And there's a lot of butterflies that are specific to this, as well as moths. And we'll go over the difference between them. Uh, it's also called Bee Bomb or Bergamot. Have you ever, ever had Earl Grey tea? This is the flavoring for Earl Grey tea. And if you crush the leaves, it smells just like that. Uh, the other one is blue wild indigo. That's one that you can find. Has anybody ever gone to that guy who's the uh, <clears throat> perennial flower grower in Farmingdale, Ciccone Farms? Oh, yeah. oh, man, that place is great. I could get lost in there for days. He's a good grower, 
and he produces a lot of interesting perennial plants that you can't find anywhere else. Sicconi Farms. He's on. You know where the Stewarts is on Route Nine? Yeah, he's uh, you go across the street there. Nine. It's on the Howell side of Nine, or I guess that's towards the Jackson side. As you head there, it's on the left-hand side. Jackson. Yeah, it's in it's in Jackson, I think. Yeah. That's his address. And if you want peppers, he he grows all kinds of weird peppers. You know, it just stuff you never find anywhere else. Um, I like to just wander around in there. The other thing is too, be, I'm 68 years old and my music is kind of out of date now, but I don't know who picks their music in the nursery, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like it's run by a bunch of hippies or something, it's, it's pretty good. So it's like a total experience, not only the flowers, it's the music too. So uh, you can probably find blue wild indigo in there. I don't know where else you would find it, but uh, if anybody has it, Sacconi Farms has it in Jackson. Um, purple coneflowers are great trees. Anybody have any of these growing in their yard? Yeah. Oh man, I got a lot of these. See, you should be rewarded for that, <laughs> for having that in your yard. Who else has it in your yard? I have. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Who else has it in your yard? <laughs> Did you have it? No? Okay. All right. This is a great, great plant. It, um, it gets nectared on by a ton of butterflies, and then it produces seeds that you'll have goldfinches hanging upside down, picking the seeds off these things all winter long. So that's one that you you can find in Sacconi Farms too. Well, he didn't actually talk to me about that, but they're there. If you want to find it in nice, nice sized plants, you can find that there. Uh, the other one is Dillon parsley, and that's not a great flower, as we all know. It's a it's an herb. But there's butterflies that feed on these. And if you plant Dillon parsley for, as an herb, put some off to the side for the butterflies because you'll find the caterpillars feeding on that. And, um, and when <clears throat> my daughters were young, I used to take cuttings, stick them in a mason jar, poke holes in it, and then they would watch it go through the stages of metamorphosis and form chrysalises, and, uh, and then we'd let it go. But it was... Uh, it's a really easy one to uh, to provide habitat for. Okay, pruning tools. This is important. I have some here. There's two kinds of pruning tools, okay? There's anvil pruners, like these, where it has a big flat area and the blade comes down in the middle of it, all right? Keep these in the store. Leave them behind. Don't buy them, all right? What you want to do is have these bypass pruners where the blade comes down on one side of it, all right? You get a cleaner cut and you can pick what side you want to do. You can maneuver it in there a lot better, all right? So if you go into the hardware store to buy a pair of pruners, don't get the anvil type, okay, which is these, all right? You want to get bypass pruners. Felco number twos is the industry standard. I'll pass that around. They're made in Switzerland, I think. They're not cheap, they're like 50 bucks. But you can, um, what's nice about it is the blade itself can be removed and replaced with a new one if it gets dull, all right? And the same for when you get to your loppers, okay? The loppers should also be bypass, not anvil. And if you have a saw, You'd be surprised, everybody is really enamored with chainsaws because they make things really easy, but if you're pruning around your house, you don't need much. A simple handsaw will do it. You can go to Home Depot and buy this at Fiskars. Seems like all the saws and pruning devices are all made in Nordic countries because they've been doing it for a century probably. So Fiskars is a company I think that's Finland or New Norway or something like that. And this is a, the saw that I use and it's really thin, and it's really sharp, and it makes a great cut. So I'll pass that around as well. You can get that in Home Depot, it's like 10 bucks. <clears throat> the other thing too, if you get those pole pruners, all right, if you notice those are really nice too, they only cut on a downward pull, all right? And there's a reason for that, because that's the way you want it to come down, okay? so. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it, it's just the way they make the, the blades in the saw. 
So bypass pruners, okay, safety is paramount when you're doing a pruning, but you want to keep those shrubs in good working order. The other thing is, when do you prune? Does anybody know when you're supposed to prune? Yes, that's right, in winter, very good. Jeez, I gotta go through a few more of these. Prune in the winter time. Why, why are you pruning in the winter time? Plants are sleeping. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. All right. Yeah, you're welcome. One of the reasons is, is um, <clears throat> what's nice is because if you prune in the winter time, they're sleeping, all the nutrients that those branches and leaves produce during the growing season are in the roots. So you're taking the branches off, all right? You're not hurting that, all right? We're not so, pruning in early spring. Um, early spring is okay. If it's trees, though, the sap's running, so you'll get the wounds will bleed. Mm -hmm. All right, not necessarily a bad thing. All right, um, <clears throat> so uh, you can. All right, late winter after the worst of the cold is done is the best time to prune. All right, um, <clears throat> and and why do you do it then? Well, because they're asleep. Uh, as long as you, you know what's alive and what's dead, okay, which is a little difficult to discern in wintertime when there's no leaves on it, but it works, okay? And, and if you have X amount of leaf surface that produces X amount of nutrients and it all goes down, X amount goes down to the roots, when you remove those branches, you only have Y left. So you get a nice flush of growth in the spring. If you want to retard that or keep your plant smaller, okay, prune it after, uh, in late spring, early, winter, early summer, okay? Then it doesn't have all that time to produce more leaves in the summer that will send it down and you won't get that big flush of growth because you kind of nipped it in the bud. Don't prune in the fall when all the diseases are out. Particular pruning question? Sure. That's about a fig tree. Okay. I'm trying to keep it down okay. and get more fruit from it. Uh -huh. I watched a guy the other day who cut it down early spring basically to nothing. And I was really anxious about that. I've cleaned out the inside, got a lot of growth, a lot of fruit. I want to prune it, I'd like to keep it down, so, but okay. I'm not sure if I want to go that method. Okay, I have to admit that I have absolutely no Italian blood in me at all. <laughs> Those Italians. It's the, therefore, I'm a little, uh, I'm a little hesitant because okay. I'm not sure about Fair things. Enough. All right. Um, I would probably Google it. Yeah, I did, and I a couple of different. He was the first one that said just trim it all the way down. Okay. But I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hanging on to it right now. Yeah. What I would do then, if if you're, uh, you want some more guidance, I would call Cooperative Extension and gotcha. Freehold and speak to the horticulturist mm -hmm. there. Okay. Uh, I don't want to give you some bad advice. Oh, good. I appreciate it. Usually I, I get questions about crepe myrtles too, mm -hmm. you know, which is, uh, it's not certainly a timber tree so, or a forest tree, so <clears throat> I hesitate. I have one in my yard and I cut it down every year to, uh, to a height. Because the one thing about crepe myrtles that people probably suspect but never realized fully is they only produce flowers on this year's wood. So if you cut it down, whatever wood it puts on that year, or growth it puts on that year, it can flower on all that, okay? So sometimes if you don't prune it, it'll, you know, the flowers are way up high. You know, if you want them where, where you can see them, close to eye level, then you gotta prune it down. Uh, where some trees, red buds, which is a native flowering tree, uh, it's being planted a lot because a lot of times it's being planted along right-of-ways underneath utility lines. It doesn't get up into the utility lines. That only produces flowers on two-year-old wood. So you'll see that last year's wood, there's no flowers. The flowers are inside, uh, and that's why. It's a, it's a little strange, but that's what happens. Okay, so don't prune in the fall, all right, because that's when all the funguses and diseases are blowing around, all right? You open it up to a wound on live, you're pruning live wood, and you have, a, you have an increased chance of uh, introducing disease to the tree. So do you prune the then in the uh, You can do it starting in, yeah, November up until March is the, is the rule of thumb for crepe myrtles. I pruned mine about a month ago. Uh, the other thing about crepe myrtles is because it's a, it's not a native. I think it comes from Asia originally, but it's been, it was planted down south because it's like, it's like zone eight, seven or eight. We never used to be able to grow that here, but I guess with climate change, it's now you, 
it, it's more, you see it a lot more than you used to. You used to see it in Virginia, now you're seeing it in New Jersey. Who knows, it could be up in Maine in 50 years. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it doesn't wake up from winter until much later. It starts uh, much later. Okay, so you can enhance your, your uh, wildlife habitat in the yard by putting up boxes. Has anybody ever seen these butterfly boxes before? Yeah. Pretty cool, right? They're nice. Does anybody have one in their yard? You do? do you, is there anything using it? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you why, okay? One of the biggest mistakes on this, and this is, um, these are two out of uh, Woodworking for Wildlife. It's, uh, I think, Pennsylvania Game Commission produces this, and it's a great because it gives you all the, you know, how much wood you need to do and how you put it together and the whole bit. It's nice. Here's the butterfly box. Here's a monarch butterfly. These butterflies will not occupy that box. They won't. And, and you'll learn why in a, in a short bit. And the other one is, is called a winter roost. And I, I, have, I have both of these in my yard, OK? I have the winter roost, too. Everybody cleans anything that looks remotely at risk or hazardous. So there's no cavities left. This, this winter roost is actually a substitute for a, a cavity. And birds will use it in the wintertime when they need to get out of the wind. All right, so I have one of those in my yard, and I have the butterfly house too. <clears throat> we'll see how we can increase our chances of the butterfly house being used. Okay, morning cloak. Has anybody ever seen this butterfly before? I saw one at Turkey Swamp Park last week when we had really warm weather. And why would I see it there? It's a, wo it's a woods butterfly, okay? It's a native, all right? And this is the butterfly, and the only one in New Jersey that can use the butterfly house, yeah. all right? Why? As an adult, he's the only one. That's right. It overwinters as an adult in New Jersey, all right? So it's the only one that could do that, because what that butterfly house does is it emulates the habitat that that butterfly would overwinter in. And other people don't realize, and we go back to that slide, those slots in the butterfly house that the butterfly can go in, what they don't tell you is you can take the top, or you should be able to take the top of that butterfly house off and put in slabs of wood, like loose leaf, and then the butterfly goes in those slots and overwinters in between those slabs of wood. Okay, it's just, it's supposed to emulate a decaying tree. That's their habitat to overwinter in. You can't get monarchs to do that because they'll overwinter at egg, as eggs and chrysalis is here, but they will not overwinter as adults. All right? So the other part of that is, what is the larval host plant? OK. There's a whole bunch of them. Willows, aspen, elms, birch, and the number one is a hackberry. All right? I have two hackberries in my yard, all right? I don't have any elms or birches or aspens or willows. And I have that butterfly house, and I have slabs of wood. And in about 25 years, when my, my yard looks like a woodland, I'm going to have this butterfly, <laughs> OK? Because it's a deep woods butterfly, all right? Because its habitat for these caterpillars are all these trees. It's not a shrub. It's not a flower, OK? But the house looks really nice. It really does. That's why I have one. So now, now you know. Morning cloak, beautiful butterfly. OK, here's the next one. Black swallowtails, that's the one that's going to eat your dill and parsley. I mean, I mean that's a really cool looking caterpillar, isn't it? I mean, it looks like something out of an Andy Warhol painting, doesn't it? Look at that. That's beautiful. And you can see them on dill and parsley. You know, it's very... <clears throat> and there's the butterfly below it, a black swallowtail. That's what it looks like. Can anybody tell the difference between... Can you tell which one is the male and which one is the female? They're a little bit different, right? It's yellow. This one's blue, right? Which one's the male and which one's the female? Did you say, Ann? I think the yellow one's the male. It's, it's the grippers on the bottom. <gasps> the, blue. the blue one is the male. The one with the blue on the bottom is the male. Really? That one there. Yep. 
Where's the gripper? I'm not sure what the gripper is. So the, the bottom, the top one that has the straight. Um, Here? Yep. Uh -huh. so the boy, Those are the grippers? The, the, the male has a, a slightly curved version of that so he can grip on okay. when they mate. You can't really see the grippers here. I can't see the grippers right Right. Uh, it's the blue. In my understanding is it's the blue that, that reveals whether or not it's a male oh, or a female. I raised yes. them. I had 19 of them over winter, and I had both yellow and blue and blue as a female. So I was asking somebody on Facebook that's an expert in that. They raised them, and they said you can have both. It's, that's not really oh, is that how right? you do it. It's the gripper. Because, and, okay. Know, like, okay, what is that? <laughs> So anyway, it was so that when they meet, they can stay together until... Okay. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to modify my presentation, that, but, if that's, that's, that's the case. Thing, uh, I found out was the black swallowtail is our New Jersey state butterfly, which I never yeah. knew we had in New Jersey. I had no idea either. But so, you know, tidbits of... Oh, just give her the whole pile, oh, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have to give out of that. <laughs> you, you did great. Yeah. So I just thought that was cool. I never knew that. I never knew that either. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to do that research myself. I was always told that the blue was a, um, was an indication that it was the male. Now I don't know. I'm looking at. We can see the grippers here and here, uh, and these are curved on the blue part. That one's not as curved. So. <laughs> I don't know. The spice bush, right on the right. The the one on the right. This is a tiger swallowtail. Tiger, tiger swallowtail. Yes. <clears throat> so in some instances, the blue is the male. I don't okay. Know <laughs> okay. And this is what the caterpillar looks like. And here's the larval host plant: tulip tree and black cherry. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Quite. It looks very similar to the black swallowtail. This one's got a forb as a lar larval host plant or an herb. This one's trees. And you can see the difference in the caterpillars as well. <clears throat> so now you know what you need to do to attract a larval host plant, which in the long run will bring you to butterflies too. Monarchs. OK, so monarchs are really cool butterflies. OK, they, they are attracted larval host plants, milkweeds, all right? Milkweed's kind of like a waste plant, and it grows in meadows, and you has a big leaf to it. You pull it apart in a sap, it looks like milk, all right? And can you tell the difference between the male and the female on monarchs? Let's, let's hope we got this one right. We got this one right. OK. Does anybody know the, how you can tell? Yes? I can't see the, the, the picture real. I believe the male's on the right because there's that little circle in the veins. That's true. That's correct, right there. Okay, that's the male. Wow. wow. We got some butterfly <laughs> folks here. Let me tell you. Yes. And there's a there's the, the caterpillar. All right. So the caterpillar is is also really really noticeable as well. And um, you know if you go down to Cape May in uh, late summer. Uh, where, where they're in the migration. You can see them there coming around the point. Um, <clears throat> almost throughout the entire day, you could see dozens of them as they're making their way south. They all end up, I think, some little place in Mexico in the mountains, right? And not one, not one butterfly uh, makes the entire route before they go through metamorphosis, lay an egg, and, and move on. So it's just a continuous migration, but no single butterfly actually makes the entire migration. <clears throat> but they're really cool. And let's see, what else we got? Uh, American copper. Has anybody ever seen this butterfly before? It's a meadow butterfly, OK? And um, its larval host plant is sheep sorrel, which it probably grows on the roadsides of every a place that isn't mowed in New Jersey. Uh, it, it's not so easy to see in that photograph, but it's a pretty common waste side weed. But it produces a beautiful butterfly like, like, uh, like the, the copper. And you can see the, the <clears throat> you wouldn't miss that, that caterpillar really easily. You, it's very difficult to see that one. So it's got great camouflage, but it's another nice, beautiful uh, native butterfly. So, as we go through 
um, <clears throat> metamorphosis, they go to chrysalis. So what do the chrysalises look like? They're all different, and they're really, some of them are pretty cool. So the black swallowtail, which we saw in there, that's what the chrysalis looks like. They all have this unique attachment point here and here, okay? But that's what it looks like. If you see that, you may not have recognized it. Now you know what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> and they're all over the, they're all over the place. Uh, you would find that stuck to a, a, an old parsley or dill plant in your garden. You, you might think it's something that's you know detrimental, but it's not. So you can bring it in or, or leave it out there and let it go through its life cycle. There's the tiger swallowtail, all right? Still has those two attachment points. Um, that one kind of looks like a... That's pretty Yeah, that one looks like a mollusk or something, doesn't it? Almost. <clears throat> so very similar butterflies, very different chrysalises. There used to be a woman at the New Jersey Flower and Garden Show that, that used to raise butterflies and she had a butterfly garden and she would, she'd sell chrysalises to you if you wanted to go through this. Uh, I don't know if anybody ever saw that woman before. I was always amazed because she kind of looked like a mad hatter as well. You know? <laughs> That's what she did. And can you transfer? Yeah, you can move that around. Yeah, yeah you take, take the, the stick off. Okay, you can stick it in a mason jar and let it go through its life cycle. <clears throat> if it's like that already, it has to stay on the stick. You can't put this way. Yeah, no, just okay. make sure you no, cut both ends of the stick off. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to do it in. <laughs> I'm not recommending that you do it, but if you wanted to. That's the monarch, monarch. chrysalis. Cool. Yeah, very much different than the other two. <clears throat> And if you see this, you, you're not going to forget what it looks like. And there's the morning cloak. Very similar, but that one almost looks like a big caterpillar. You can see it. It's got the horns on it here. Mm -hmm. You get up close. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're in the woods and you see that, you know you're going to have a, a, a morning cloak. That'll overwinter in a butterfly house <laughs> if you're in New Jersey. Okay, how about anybody ever seen this before, that hummingbird clear wing moth? Yeah. Those are really cool. Yeah, they look like a hummingbird, but they're smaller. But they'll, uh, they'll hit any kind of flower, it seems to me. If you have annual flowers, you're planting patience or begonias, you'll find those as well. And it's a really cool bird, uh, moth, that looks like a bird. And there's a the caterpillar below it, okay? <coughs> Kind of looks like one of those tomato hornworms that's been eating your tomatoes, but it's a little bit smaller than that. But this is really cool if you can get that attracted to your house to, to watch that, because it'll hit your plants every day, uh, which is unusual for moths. Why? It's the difference between moths and butterflies, all right? Moths are usually nocturnal or crepuscular, dawn and dusk. Butterflies are out during the day. So they, they kind of share the same habitat, but just different times, okay? Um, <clears throat> and how can you tell the difference? The moth antenna are kind of feathery from top to bottom. Butterflies are kind of fine with a point at the top, like my favorite Martian, if you were, <laughs> you date. Well, I know I see people that are shaking their heads, they're, they're dated like me. Okay, he was more like a butterfly, not a moth, uh, my favorite Martian. Uh, this, has anybody ever seen that sphinx moth? No. That, that's big. I mean, it's, if you see it, um, you see, I've only seen it at night, but it's big. And that moth, when it matures into that adult stage, it never feeds. It's got fatty tissues. It spends its, that caterpillar spends its entire life eating to produce enough calories for it to survive long enough as, a, as an adult to mate. So it never feeds, just searches for a mate and hopes it can before it runs out of gas. <laughs> uh, but it's spectacular. It really, it looks like something from outer space, really a, 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 cool, a cool moth. And the other one is the Eastern Kama, which is uh, a really cool butterfly as well. Uh, <clears throat> 
there's certain species that share habitats. They just occupy it at di different times of the day. And that's what we're talking about between moths and butterflies. Another more advanced one of that is a great horned owl and a red-tailed hawk. They occupy the exact same habitat, which is woods and fields mixed. But the uh, great horned owl hunts at night and the red-tailed hunts during the day. <clears throat> So what do we have here? How many people have seen that in, in trees in the woods? Okay. What is that? Does anybody know what that is? Woodpecker activity. It's not a woodpecker. And how do we know that? We know that because the holes are horizontal. Okay. Sap suckers. <laughs> All right, which is a little bit different. Looks just like a woodpecker, but it's a little bit different. So now you can identify if you have sap suckers in your yard, even without seeing the sap sucker, because there it is. If it's horizontal like that, it's a sap sucker. And and I'll show you another one too that, that's very indicative of that. Okay, there's the little sap sucker right there. How many people have seen that on their holly? Okay. You see how they're in here like that? I had a buddy call me up the other day and said, this is all over the Mount Laurel webpage. Nobody knows what this is. And they want to know what it is. Bill, do you know what it is? I said, it's a sap sucker. And, and it's exactly how this appears on holly or maples that have a really smooth bark. And a sap sucker is not hunting for insects, larvae, like woodpeckers are, all right? It, it knocks a hole in there and it's, uh, it's got a name to it, okay? It's a sizable robin and it has a different feeding habit than a woodpecker, all right? Woodpeckers are looking for insects, okay? They feed on insects on dead and dying trees, right? Which we know. Sap suckers are drilling into the xylem, which is the water transport section of the tree or what's called sapwood, or the phloem, which the nutrients are coming up from, or going down from the, uh, the leaves, all right? And it's doing exactly that. It has a tongue like a brush and it's soaking up all that sap, okay? And if you look closely, all right, it'll excavate a well, is what these are called, depending on a time of year to take advantage of where those nutrients or water are flowing. So the er, the the less deep one is in the early spring, okay? Uh, all right, and the real, or, or in the early spring when the, it's coming up through the phloem. And the deeper ones here, you see how much deeper that is? That's due to phloem into the xylem or the sapwood for the water. It has a little bit of nutrients and sugars in it as well, all right? So that's the difference. They're on the vertical or the horizontal plane. If you see that, it's a sap sucker. And I have a holly in my yard that looks exactly like that one all the way on the right. Okay. Woodpecker holes are random, okay? They could be anywhere in the tree, all right? But they certainly don't have that horizontal look or the vertical look on the one on the right. They like tree species with high sugar concentration, so that's maples, hollies, and um, <clears throat> birches and hickories, all right? That's where you'd find them most. And there's only one in the east, and that's that yellow-bellied sapsucker. All right, so what else do we have here? Anybody know that bird? That's right, it's a downy woodpecker. Who said that? I did. <laughs> Take another one. <laughs> Here you go. We have those Thank in you. Yard. Yeah, that's this one is um, the smallest and most widespread of the woodpeckers. All right, the downy woodpecker. It's little. It's like um, <clears throat> I guess um, this small bird, like junco size. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, it, it one's voted the one most likely to come to your bird feeder. Yeah. All right, so it's pretty common. <clears throat> Anyone know that one? That's a flicker. That's right. It's a newer, 
Northern Flicker. Oh, yeah. Flicker. That's a good one. It's robin sized. This is a cool bird. It really is. And you can see that's its actual tongue. All right. It's got a, a really unusual tongue that curls in the back of its head like a, a coil where like you'd roll up a hose and then it comes out like that. It doesn't necessarily uh, use that tongue in a tree. It'll go into anthills. OK, so you'll see them feeding on the ground a lot. And if it flies, it, it kind of flies like a bell curve. OK, and it has white on the back of it. So it almost looks like a cottontail rabbit flying. All right. And it has all woodpeckers have that red mark on their head. <coughs> so that's a really cool native bird as well. So, yeah, it goes to anthills, but it, it will knock on trees as well as the other woodpeckers. Now, here's a really cool one. Anybody ever seen that before? You know what that is? <laughs> Has anybody ever seen those big square holes in the trees in the woods? We never used to see this as kids. Like I said, I'm 68, and the woods in New Jersey were a lot younger. OK, they were early successional trees when I was a kid. So we had early successional birds, grouse and, and quail and stuff like that. Now, the woods are 80 to 100 years old. All right, they're older. And we have woodpeckers because the trees are getting old and they, they have a lot of bugs in them. All right. And this we never saw as a kid. Now I can't, almost can't go out in the woods now without seeing this. That's a pileated woodpecker. All right. It's big really big, crow-sized, and it looks like it's prehistoric. This is the, this is the bird that the guy that, that invented Woody Woodpecker was thinking of when he did it, okay? And if you hear this thing hammer in the woods, it, it, it'll spread across a, a large area. And it's feeding, okay, and creating those big, giant square holes. So if you go out in the woods and you see those square holes, you know there's a pileated woodpecker out there. Why? OK, he's big and he likes to hammer and he hammers not just for food. All right. He's hammering because he wants to. And it's almost a, I think it's part of the courting ritual. The louder and, and faster he can hammer, I guess, is very attractive to the missus. And so uh, he's got a better chance to mate. Um, and he ev and she evolved with carpenter ants, all right? So that's its main food source. So if you got a lot of carpenter ants in there, he's gonna hammer that tree until it's a big square hole, and then he's gonna visit it a couple times a day to see if he can't pick the ants that are moving up and down inside there. Very cool bird. Never used to see this as a kid, but now you almost can't not see one if you're in the woods. Okay. How many of these? Okay, here's the one where if you look at something that looks like it's a big problem and you can't really see it, but who's seen maples that are just black all over the trunk like that? I get calls every year of somebody saying they think their maples are dying and thinking it's, um, you know, it's some kind of disease. But really, if you look at it, all right, you see the sap sucker holes coming across here? Uh -huh. All right. You can't really see it here, but there's sap sucker holes here too. So if you see that, it's not black knot, okay? And it's not fire blight, which some people will say, because it looks like it's been burnt. Mm -hmm. All right. Here's another one there. New, all right. Sap sucker came in the spring and now it's leaking sap. And, uh, it's sooty mold. Sooty mold is there because it's the fungus flying through the air that gets attracted to that sugar, it gets stuck to the side of the tree. Next thing you know, it looks black, all right? And it has absolutely no impact on a tree whatsoever. Sap sucker holes can start that tree leaking and the sap running out of the holes. And then the sooty mold shows up and it looks terrible, but it doesn't, it's not a problem with the trees at all. It's harmless. Okay, you can also get some of this. Aphids will, will also suck the juices out of leaves and twigs, but it's scattered. It's not like on a, it's not on the trunk of the tree that you get from sapsucker damage. 
And so <clears throat> it could be a problem if the aphids are really bad and you may need to treat that, but the sooty mold itself is not an indication of anything except that you probably have sap suckers hitting a tree. So you don't need to be concerned about it. Bee houses, anybody have a bee house? Which one do you have? Do you want on the left or the one on the right? The tubes or just the holes drilled? Uh, the bamboo tubes. Okay. Uh, is it being used well? Not yet. Okay. When did you, have you had it up for a while? Uh, about two years ago. Okay, nothing. No. No, okay. Uh, these are for native bees, okay? Uh, the European honeybees, the one that, that all the uh, commercially uses to produce the honey and they have the hives, you know, the big square hives you see in a farm field, all right? With the, that decline complex that's hit the European honeybees, there's an effort to try to increase the habitat for the native bees, all right? And these holes drilled in, I have one like this, it's made out of Atlantic white cedar, and it's a 5 16th hole that's drilled in there, and these bees are called mason bees, all right? And they, they'll lay an egg and then they'll mud it up like a mason. And then they'll lay another egg and mud it up. And then if you see them filled like this, then you know that there's bees are occupying that. And then, um, <clears throat> then the eggs will hatch and the, and the bees will come out and, uh, and they'll help pollinate your, your plants. Uh, the native bees are much smaller than, um, than the European honeybee. And uh, I have this and, and, and I clean it out every year, but I, I do get those mason bees in there. You, you, you probably will find that you, you can attract them. And, um, and, and I, I get a lot of zucchinis as a result of that um, because uh, bees pollinate that. Has anybody ever seen one of these before? Do you know what that is? It, it's a bumblebee house, okay? Bumblebees are ground nesters, all right? So you dig a big hole, you put a bunch of cotton batting, you got a pipe that comes up to the surface with a hose, all right? And then you cover it back up and then the bees will go in there and, and you'll have bumblebees. Bumblebees are pretty good pollinators. Sometimes they're so fat that they can't pollinate the little flowers, <laughs> all right? But if they're big flowers, okay, like you would get with um, zucchinis, uh, they, can, they can do a pretty good job with them. So that's, uh, that's a bumblebee house. You don't see them because they're, they're ground nesters. But it's a thought if you, if you wanted to. I love bumblebees, they're really good for pollinating your rhododendrons. They seem to like those a lot, too. And what do we have left? We have bats. Is it, who has a bat house? Anybody have a bat house? Do you have bats in it? Yeah. There's, yeah, I, I've had mine up for 20 years, and I haven't had a bat attracted to it either. I've had them in my attic, which I wasn't trying to. You have them in your attic, too? No, I had a big hornet nest in it, though. Oh, okay. Oh, that was in the bat house. Okay. Um, they're very particular bats about what, uh, you know, obviously because a lot of people have bat houses, but they don't have bats in them. And uh, if you wanted a maternity house, the maternity house is like 36 inches by four. I mean, they're huge. You would need a crane to set it. Mm -hmm. It's so heavy. These are what's known as bachelor houses, so that uh, um, it's, you know, uh, bats that are foraging and want to spend the night kind of deal, they, they would go into these. Um, <clears throat> and there's one bat that would use this, and you'll see the asterisk, the little brown, brown bat. There's nine, and this is another one that changed over the years. There used to be six native bats in New Jersey, now there's nine. Really? Yeah, yeah, there's another three that, that occupy. I don't know if it's a result of climate change or, or what. Um, but it's the little brown bat that would uh, occupy this house, okay? Um, and I still have hope. One of, the things, one of the things about these is they have to be up really high. Is yours up high? How high uh, uh, off the ground? Not in the sun, it's on the, um, I think it's on the eastern side of the house. It's above my garage. Okay, 16 to 20 feet high. Because they're gonna drop out of that and they need enough airspace to be able to, to take flight. They like it hot, so I have mine paid in brown to capture the sun, and they're really long this way because they want to be able to move up and down in that to, to take advantage of the temperature if it's too hot or too cold. Um, 
as a mammal, they, can, they have a hard time regulating their temperature. That's why they're always in spaces where it's hot, like in your attic or in old barns. You know, sometimes in the bat house. I haven't been able to get them either, but I'm still hopeful. And they have, they have you'll see the slots in them. Does yours have like a hardware cloth or wire in it for them to climb up and down as well? Yeah, because they like to go up and down in there. Uh, the little brown bat is the one that would occupy that. And I have some uh, pictures of them. Okay. The largest in the New Jersey bats, five to six inches with a 17 inch wingspan. I have never seen one of these bats, okay? Yeah, that's a big bat. That's a big bat. The big brown bat is maybe half that size, okay, which I have seen. But who's, who's seen in late summer in dust the little bats flying around your house, right? Those are the little brown bats, okay? And you'll see them, they, they're, you know, they take advantage of street lights and stuff with the moss, because they eat moss a lot, okay? They eat a lot of moss. Little brown bats eat mosquitoes too, if they're out that late. But dive bombing into, I always see them dive bombing into the Very bed. cool, yeah, it's nice. It's and have you noticed we hadn't seen a bunch of bats for a few years? Mm -hmm. They're back again. Mm -hmm. Last year there was a bunch of bats, it seems like they're very cyclic in their populations. Yes, yes Assuming one doesn't have a barn and one has successfully kept them out of the attic and one doesn't have a bat house, yeah. where do they live? Uh, they live in, um, any suitable habitat, which includes those warm spaces. So a lot of times they're in structures, okay? Uh, or they're, um, they're inside uh, tree cavities or in trees that are rotting, that, that the bark's shedding, but there's spaces they can go okay. up in, okay? Um, the next one is the big, big brown bat. And I have pictures of all these. Now the first one, that hoary bat, is a cool picture. I hope you can see it. Doesn't he look like an old man in the mountain? Yeah. He's even got whiskers. I mean, you know, he almost looks like, uh, what was that, Jeremiah Johnson movie where he's got a dead animal on his head there, you know, like a <laughs> raccoon hat? Uh, he, that's a pretty cool bat. <clears throat> and it's big. And there is the big brown bat right there. You know, some of these bats, if you see the pictures of them, they have a face only a mother could love. <laughs> and the little brown bat is kind of that way. <laughs> now that's a cool bat. But you can see that somebody holding it, that bat is tiny. Mm -hmm. And it's not the smallest of our native bats. Some of the native bats are almost not much bigger than a moth, the little ones. But um, <clears throat> that's the one that, would, that we're hoping to attract to our bat houses. Even though we see them flying around in late summer, it seems like all the time. And so there's habitat associated with them as well. And that's, that's the presentation. If you have any questions, there's a lot of information. This will be posted to the website, okay? So you can then click on those links if you want, any additional information. What's your website? Uh, that's not my website. Oh, that's no, the, no, we're all this way. Yes. Oh, it, I'm sorry. Belmar Shade Tree Commission. Yes. Belmar Borough, and then the Shade Tree Commission, and we also have a Facebook page, Belmar Shade Tree Commission. And we'll put it on the library website. Yes. In the library too. Listen, I have other stuff from Forest Fire Service as well. If anybody wants to trade in some bookmarks for carpenter pencils, I can do that as well. <laughs> I, I also have refrigerator magnets as well. I think Smokey's on that as well, so feel free. Was there any questions? How come you have maples on your favorite trees? You know, maples are okay, but they're not great wildlife habitat plants. But they need to right? Maples are native. Yes, they are natives. Sugar maple's um, a little bit better in terms of what it can attract and, and sustain in terms of wildlife. But it's really, it's a little too far south for that tree to do well here. It, it, it doesn't like the hot, humid summers we have and it struggles, especially as a street tree. I don't recommend them as a street tree at all. Have you found any, uh, yeah. have you found any animals to eat the spotted, spotted lanterns? Yeah.
Um, you know, that's interesting. I just read some research on it. Okay, yeah, please do. Uh, just as a quick reminder, this website, this video is going to be posted to two websites, the library website and on the web page for the uh, Shade Tree Commission on the Belmar Borough website. And, page, yeah. and on the Facebook page, yeah. too. So. We got it covered. Yep, you got it right there. So. Remind them to sign in. Yes, and if you haven't signed in on your way in, please sign in on your way out, please. I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. And everybody, a warm thank you, applause for Bill for coming tonight. Thank you very much. I'm glad. And have a good night. I hope you brought something home. The spotted lanternfly, they did research on it. It has, uh, it comes from Asia, okay? And the host plant is uh, a non-native, uh, Atlantis, or a uh, tree of heaven. If, it, if the lanternfly is feed, feeding on that, they find out that the native birds don't really eat it. If, it, if it's feeding on a native vegetation, if they hit that and they...